you can still hold close to one of the helicopters in front of you. I'm right up to here, right up to here. Right up to here. Right up to here. You're going to be in the shade. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Yep. I'm going to go up so you can see right there in the shade. Come on up a little closer on this side. Let's get right up for me and Audrey here. Come on, don't be shy. Don't roll down. Stay in focus. Focus. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah. I don't doubt. Do we have any more gin more No, the one that was giving Are you ready? Who's the yeah. Rob? Okay. okay. No. Welcome, everybody, to our dedication My. for LJ Fiegel. Okay. Please know that we would not be gathered here today without Scott's 12 years of dedication and <laughs> And all the meetings with the Park Department. <laughs> I can't count them all. In planning this sundial tribute, Scott promised his dad that he would carry on the plans that were originated with Mac and Elizabeth over 20 years ago to honor my father's memory with all of his contributions to the city during his lifetime on this property that he once owned. Scott's daughter Erin, where are you? Right here. Oh, Scott's daughter Erin, um, um, a landscape architect, came from Naperville, Illinois and presented the plan for approval at the Park Department several years ago. And now I'm the last sibling of six to witness this special occasion but we know that Leland, Elizabeth, Elaine, Levon, and Le <laughs> Oh, just a minute. Thank Our hungry go. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll show you the, the property where the Shorewood Retirement Facility, Shorewood, as now stands, was once referred to as Ranch where Sister LaVon and Jack Stutz raised their family. David and Dick and Dan, along with Scott and Kirby, had lots of turkey hunting days and escapades with Grandpa in the fields down to the creek that has been dredged to form Cascade Lake. Other children, other grandchildren, had fun on a city golf driving range located on the property. LJ, as he was later known to many friends, chose to leave the farm where he grew up near Salem Corners with 10 siblings in favor of a career in the Rochester community and attended the former business college. In 1911, at the age of 28, he was elected county auditor for eight years before he resigned to begin his banking career. He worked through the ranks to executive positions in two banks. He retired in 1950 from the First National Bank after more than 30 years, as, and then he was elected president of the Olmsted County Bank and Trust until he finally retired at the age of 75. But he served as director of the bank until his death in, the, in 1969. He once told me he believed he knew everyone in Olmsted County. During the Depression, he befriended uh, many farmers in the area who were grateful for his paintings. <clears throat> LJ became one of the city's most active and prominent citizens through the years, as he was well known for his many civic activities and involvements. <clears throat> in 1928, Dad was one of five men who put up $15,000 capital to start Rochester Airways, uh, Rochester's first organized airport on what was, what was the, golf, uh, the golf range followed that. And then he contributed greatly to the financial life of Rochester, serving on countless boards and committees over, over the years. Among these, he was a school commissioner. He was elected as head of the courthouse advisory committee to build a new courthouse. He was a member of the city charter commission. He was a member of the school board, a treasurer of the Methodist Hospital Board, a member of the board of directors of the Mayo Memorial Association, 
and a life member of the Olmsted County Agricultural Society, former president of the Rochester Council of Parent Teachers Association, former board member of the Rochester Methodist Church, which is now Christ United Methodist Church, and he served as treasurer of the Olmsted County Historical Society from the time it was organized in 1926 until 1952. Remember, everything was typed or handwritten in those days. There were no computers. So he had a very dependable typewriter, and he typed the family, the kids, um, every Sunday night with carbon copies. And I usually got the full one. <laughs> 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 Um, then he served on the committee of, oh my nose is running, just a minute. He served on the board of the, okay. Um, he, he served on the Committee of Industrial Opportunities, which assisted with the selection of Rochester for the site of IBM. In fact, Leland, who was a colonel in the Air Force and killed in a plane accident after the war, was a close flying friend of Tom Watson, who assured our family that IBM would be built here no matter what his board said. <laughs> LJ was a recipient of honors from many civic and Masonic organizations. He was a member of the Lions Club, Templars, Knight Templars, a charter member of the Kiwanis Club, which made him a life member and named its annual Rochester Junior College Scholarship in his honor in 1969, the year of his death. The Chamber of Commerce also made him a life member at the time of his retirement from the Olmsted County Bank, he said, Throughout my life, I have felt an obligation to my home country and to this city, which have been so good to my family and me. I will continue to try to manifest appreciation for that kindness and support. My dad said, I believed I lived in the best era, despite World War II and the loss of England. There's a closeness in our community and a wonderful one to raise a family. He also believed, he, oh, he was an a avid and competitive bridge player, and he believed that he and Dr. Elf Adson were the best defensive players in Rochester, <laughs> and uh, that he knew. As a young man, he played on baseball teams here and continued his interest in the sport throughout his life. Uh, a few months before he died, and was t uh, in the Madonna Towers uh, assistant living, I drove him back to Soldiers Field where he used to play ball and watch the ball game from the car. He just loved that. It seemed to stimulate it. And he and Mother used to have a good hot game of gin rummy every night <laughs> whenever he didn't have a meeting. So um, in closing, I would like to mention my mother's constant loving support in keeping the home fires burning as a homemaker, busy as a seamstress in her sewing machine, creating meals for the family dinners, always planning dessert first, <laughs> and all the while trying to keep pace with her six kids. There were 18 years between Leland and Lech, my youngest brother, and both my parents would be so proud and happy that 14 of their 21 grandchildren and four greats would come from all over the country to attend a memorable tribute to their grandparents. Quite a reunion for everyone. Now the place will forever welcome those who seek a spot to rest in its beauty here and pondering their future. Thank you for coming. Props. Yeah. Scott's going, going to explain the sundial and its inception. And <laughs> oh, wow, nice visual.
guys in the back line still trying to read it. Uh, I don't have time to read it. Oh, these are animals. Having pots full and to keep somebody looking at someone since I can't remember all this stuff. I made a little timeline. Hey. <laughs> We're on a time schedule and stuff like that. So, in 1930, Deb Fiegel, north of town, bought a farm, and it was about 250 acres. And my dad used to talk about the two horses he had, Victory and Sage, out there, and going out and dealing with all that. He sold that land in, 19, in the 1950s, and in 1944, he bought this land. In 1928, as mentioned, it was right over there that we had Rochester's first airport. And they put in 15,000, they had uh, a squadron of planes in Michigan fly over and land, and they had some big planes land because this was going to be the airport. The following week, they came back, but they landed over by, if you know where the corn cob is at Libby's, that was mail property. And so they had 268 acres. So pretty soon, this airport that they had done so much work for uh, kind of evaporated. Well, in 1933, he and Leland went to the World's Fair in Chicago. And I had the book that was from a World War I ace entitled, To Leland, Hope to See You the Next Time with Your Flying Wings. So I don't know if it was a combination of seeing the planes land here, and I think there was 20-some, you know, landed in these big planes, and that, the next thing you know, uh, Leland's in uh, flight school at the University of Minnesota. And so in spite of what's been written in the paper, that he wasn't a pilot, he was in the flying school in um, University of Minnesota and landed, it used to be called Holman Field, and now it's where the regular airport is. So anyway, in 1944, he purchased this property, the same property that he had rented in 1928, and it was what I called the ranch, other people called it, well, it was Stutz's, and I, David Stutz is probably the one that knows more about exactly what goes on here you know, than I do. But in 1967, he put it into the trust. So the first thing in the paper that I have seen really was in 1970 when the city was floating a proposal for this kind of a thing. And there were issues about subdivisions out here. And the Lakeshore Trail, this, this became the 90s and all this. Well, finally, Matthew, who was the, had signed a contract, right about here they had an offer for $830,000 $830, to sell it. And the contract, it went through and went through, and then it got voided at the end. <laughs> so it was like back to square one. Everybody thought, you know, it's over. So that was, you know, the 90s. In 1999, the city then took over, and they were going to buy it from Matthew because Matthew had just pretty much, you know, mined it off and said, well, we need X many years. So supposedly it went up to 2023 before the mining thing was going to get done. So there were three plans. One of the plans, and this is what my dad and Elizabeth thought, they were going to redevelop and they had to pay sewers, um, gutters, uh, city water supply all through that edge. And then um, right through here they connected Country Club Manor with power line, and it was like a 60-foot easement that you know went all through down there to kind of connect it to the city. So they had three plans, and, and the one plan from the Corps of Engineers in the late 70s and early 80s, oh, for flood control, we think we're going to build a berm down the middle of the Fiegel property that was going this way. So on that side, it was going to be dry, potentially flood water, and on this side, it was going to be swamp. And so Elizabeth and Lester, they went to all these city meetings and it got reordered and one of the plans was back here to have all the development on the Aaron's property and then the houses over there and this was all going to be kind of washed out area. So anyway, at some point they selected this plan right here and are you going to have two lakes or are you going to have three lakes and here are the berms and here's the mining. So the mining contract kept getting extended by a, another 10 year period. So at this period, put your thumb right there young man. So in 19 or in 2016, they finally came out and said, well, we have a spot we think that would work for you. And I met with Mr. Nigber. We started out, where's the director? This gentleman right here is oh, he the is. man in charge. Well, we started with uh, Roy Sutherland. I don't know if you remember him. He would meet with Dave Stutz. Where's David? There's Dave. We would meet out here every year, year after year after year. And what's the plan? <coughs> How's it going? And stuff. Well. In truth, the park department did more to get this whole program done than any one of us. And so Dave and I would meet with, with um, Roy Sutherland, then uh, uh, Mr. Stoltz, and then uh, 
Mr. Nigber, and finally Jeff Feast, and they've all been wonderful of, of getting this and, and keeping all this. I mean, it, my dad would write and say, can you meet us? And it was always, I mean, just perfect. And so they're really the ones that, you know, got the outline and we just had to wait. Well, the people that live in that senior home over there, they gave, I think it was two million, um, the director, they, an, another million and a half came from the city and then was it, I don't know, was it two years ago? That, Regional Park status, they gave five million. So, some to effect, you know, like that. So anyway, at that point, this point, he, you know, Mike came out and said, this looks like a perfect place because they're eventually they're going to build a fishing pier right out here. And there's still, that stuff really hadn't been developed if, when you looked around when it came in. So once that, that extra money came in, it all came to be. So it got close. These were the homes that were all up there. My grandpa had started Hillcrest Service Station. And so where the little cabins were up there, there was a gas station. And so when it came down to Matthew buying it all, they said, well, since there was a gas station there, um, we got to check, see if there's any buried tanks. Oh. So they hired a consultant from the cities to come down. We went back and forth every square foot. It was kind of like pushing a lawnmower, had a computer on it. And then there were two big blips. Oh, there's some metal down here. So, you know, do you remember Mick Heinrichs? You know, from that, you know, from my grand class, he was working up the street, and I had seen him on the way in with a backhoe. So I got him to bring his backhoe out there. We dug out, you know, with this backhoe, and we came up with the top of a metal rim that was on a sewer pipe and an old wagon wheel that was about this thing. So, you know, we're oh hey, well then the DNR came out and said, uh, well you need an impact statement, and in this impact statement, the guy from the DNR had said, well on a little cement pad so if you can imagine there's these little cabins up there uh, you know 10 yards from the road that used to be the main road to byron he saw a blandings turtle which happened to be endangered <laughs> oh, in no. the you know state of minnesota so oh no we have a blandings turtle sighting on this area we can't do any development in this whole thing because you know this turtle and so one of my friends was a herpetologist you might know him if you ever ate at Michael's. It was Charlie Pappas' son, oh, or no, his brother's son. Anyway, he went over and he goes down to Wabasha and they walk Blanding's turtles across the road, you know, when they're down there so they, they know. He says, this is not an endangered species turtle habitat because there was no water up and you know, maybe it was a little ditch down here. So after that, it all got done. So, my artwork, it all came down to a turtle. Well, that's why we're really here today, that we found that there wasn't a, a turtle crossing. But Grandpa Fiegel's farm, if you go that direction, about six miles, that's where he was born in 1884, and it was, I don't know, like 350 acres, 360 acres. And then, like I said, as the crow flies, it's about six miles. So he got about six miles in terms of where he grew up to, you know, where, you know, my dog's ashes are. <laughs> or something like, 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 like that for hunting and stuff. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Any, Dave, do you have any, can you give us another story of anything out here? Um, I, I drove my first, yeah, I drove my first car. My grandpa had a, 1963 Buick Special. I'd never driven, and there was a pine tree strip, and he'd just go back in there and, t you know, wrap a rope around something and tell me to drive. Yeah. <laughs> so we just pulled it out. Well, I was probably about 12 years old. And he lived not far from the mother house over there, <coughs> and he used to say, well, "Okay, now just back it out of the driveway. Back it out of the driveway. Okay." And then one day he said, "Just keep driving." I was like 12 or 13, you know, I didn't know, but way we drove over here because my dad kind of worked over there, and he just dropped me off over here and. He, Danny and I would be, you know, fiddle around down in the creek and, you know, doing that kind of stuff. So I, I don't know. It was always a, a special place, more so maybe than those that weren't around all the time. But it, it really was kind of a neat thing. And, and to see all the, you know, people and the seniors, they come out and water and fiddle around and, and, and stuff like that. But anyway. Rental place, we can. The noise, the conversation is filling the atmosphere. Yeah, let's take that to the summer beach. That's right. So, anyway, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, they had a um, <coughs> B24 land over here in Rochester, and I got the last seat on it. Uh, so, I got to go up, and that was Leland's plane. He landed this B24 at the Rochester airport in 1945. It wasn't the same one, and they said it's the only the last one there. So 
that I want for you. These things, and this is where when I when I talked to the artist, he said, "Well, this is somewhat of an abstract sundial." Because <laughs> for those of you kind of wondering what's going on, I did too. But anyway, these bases go by month, and oh. they start with down here. This is December, and they work up. So each notch is supposed to be for the day. And there's a nubbin in here. And as he has explained, you're supposed to go away around and find your thing. And that was going to be the thing that kids were supposed to do. What got kind of lost in the whole program was a little bit of the, the money issue because originally the plan was to have a sundial. And I'm all, almost at my time up. But they had, um, <laughs> there's still kind of a, an issue that we're going to get. And I said, well, this used to be my bucket list to meet all you here, but now I guess I have an additional little thing. To get a little bit more of the signage along the ground to make it a, a true sign. And for this, this is Erin over here, my daughter. She spent a lot of time on these things starting in, you know, whatever, 1999, of trying to get it and going back wow. and forth with the wonderful people from the park department <laughs> that, you know, have been so really accommodating. And that boulder over there, I came down about three weeks ago and met with the guy, took it over to his place, and they, they carved it all out and delivered it. And I know the city did that, you know, and probably, you know, I don't, I don't know how the billing goes, but I appreciate that the city did it, not uh, the stone cutter because he said he couldn't lift it and it was going to cost three times as much or something yeah. to that effect. But that little thing there and then the, the bronze got just um, put in here Friday uh, underneath for Lesta and Anna on underneath oh. that. So um, that pretty much is uh, the spiel. What? What is and I, so Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, I want to tell you, I'm invited to go. And Audrey has one more thing to ask. Scott. Scott. Michael. After you're through talking, Scott, everyone's invited to go to Summer Bay because the room has been reserved till all hours of the night. What? Yeah. <laughs> uh oh, now, watch out, Marla. We're going to have That's a, a cash box. We're going to have a <laughs> get together. We've rented, a, a, I mean, I have a re room reserved at Summer Bee with a balcony on the outside. You can have your cool drinks. And then um, at 4.30, I have a hors d'oeuvre plate. And then at 5.30, we have a buffet. And following the buffet, we have a special treat, a family surprise. Ooh, right. DJ? The Polka Band showing up. A kiss, a kiss impersonator band. Have you met Leland? Yeah, I did. Okay, good, good. Good. Good.